All right, welcome to episode number 17 of the Jake Blanchard podcast. Uh, before we get started today, I want to just again give a shout out to Fellowship Brands uh, men's grooming products. Uh, I got purity in my beard. Go to fellowshipbrand.com and check out what they have to offer. A lot of exciting uh, new grooming products for men. Uh, my guest today on episode 17 is Trin Long. Uh, he's a man of many, many talents uh, and adventures, and I'm looking forward to talking to him about that today. Uh, he comes from a family of competitive water sports athletes. Uh, he spent several seasons traveling the world, competing in World Cup circuits and world championships, uh, and training at a training and racing at an elite level. Um, and this is in kayaking, by the way. Uh, when he's not traveling, he focuses his time uh, on the family rafting and kayaking business on the Payette River in Idaho, Cascade Raft and Kayak. Uh, Trent also happens to be a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Uh, he's a world traveler with his family. Overall, cool and interesting guy. Uh, I'm looking forward to unpacking his competitive drive, his mindset, his adventures, and all that stuff. Trent, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Yeah, man. Thanks for having, you, having me. See, excited to uh, share the joy. Yeah, well, I know when we were scheduling this, you told me you were out there in Oklahoma City. Um, I was expecting you, based on you know following your Facebook, to be in Chile or Australia or Eastern Europe or Africa or somewhere like that. <laughs> it was those places. I, I came home for this. The uh, <laughs> we have a, a Thanksgiving camp, so it's uh, ten days, and it's sort of in the build up to twenty twenty one. Uh, there's a bunch of baseline assessments and stuff with the US OPC and then, you know, the team sort of gets together and we spend, I think it's, I think it's 10 or 11 or 12 days. I forgot how many, but uh, just sort of laying the base for next season and starting to, you know, build up momentum. A lot of, a lot of that's what the name of the game in this sport is to have that momentum and the trajectory to take you into the season. So that's sort of what we're starting now. Yeah. Maybe talk, talk to me a little bit more about, the this sport in general i'm very kind of an outsider looking in it's yeah uh, and, and uh i know very little about it and maybe the folks listening to might might not know a ton about it so yeah it's not it's not widely known so i i compete in two disciplines one of them is uh canoe or kayak slalom and essentially what happens is you have like a rapid you know some white water and they suspend uh two poles that are about a meter and a half apart and that makes a gate and you have to negotiate the gate either going downstream or upstream. So in a course, they'll have up to 25 gates and up to six of them will be designated as upstream gates. So they'll have, you know, they're green and white if you go down and then they're red and white if you have to turn around and actually come back through them upstream. Uh, if you touch a pole, two seconds is added to your time. And if you miss a gate altogether, 50 seconds is added to your time and it's fastest person down wins. So the river's rushing and you're trying to use how, how far are the poles apart that you have to go through? Uh, it's a, it depends. They vary between a meter and a meter, like 1.2 meters. So, so it's not a huge, feet? yeah, typically they're a little narrower than that, but it's, uh, it's not massive. Uh, and they get real, can they get really tight and really wide. You, they can, it's a really incredibly challenging sport. I mean, the thing with whitewater is that it's never the same. So you could have a, a rapid and you could run it 10 times and every time you get in there, it's going to be different. And so, so much of the sport that we do, you know, there's a technical base, there's a physical base, uh, but it's performance is where people who shine really shine because you have to be adaptive. You don't know, you know, some of the waves like rivers naturally build and fall like in the ocean, they get bigger and then they crash, bigger and crash. So you could be paddling down and instead of it being a wave, it's there the feature could be underwater altogether or it could be a foamy pile which drastically changes your approach your line and so there's no it's not like you know set it and forget it you don't just paddle down you have to be adaptive to the second to every bit of water that surrounds you as you paddle down the stream so it's incredibly challenging it's one of the uh, for me you know i've i've but in my background, like with Brazilian Jiu Jitsu and MMA, like man versus man is really fun. But this is like man versus nature and man versus self, because you're only I mean, the only person that can beat you is you and Mother Nature. And sometimes she's not quite as friendly. So yeah, it's uh, it's an incredibly challenging for sport. It it uh, it I think that's sort of for me what hooked me in early is, you know, just the fact you could go and have just like a perfect run and then go back to do it again and then just totally beat her. It's just because you weren't 
you weren't paying attention. You were too busy on your laurels of your first run and you thought you had it and you just, and you suck. So it's, it's very demanding. It's, it's a really demanding both mental and physical sport. So what's, how, how does the associations or affiliations, like as far as like competition go, is this like at a, a global level? Is it a national sport? Like take me through that. Yeah. So, uh, canoe slalom is, a, is an Olympic discipline. So, uh, we have been since 92, um, and there's an over, like the, the global government for canoe slalom is the International Canoe Federation, the ICF, and the ICNet, ICF organizes World Cups and World Championships. Um, and so those are the big races. So like when I go to Europe to race, I typically go out for a World Cup or, or World Championships. And then you have national races in the U.S. Our national governing body is the uh, American Canoe Association, the ACA. And so the ACA is like, who organized this camp I'm at now? They organize team trials and selections. And then you go down to regional. And then regional slalom races are just typically recreational paddlers who enjoy doing it. And they throw up some gates. And that's what I, you know, that's, we still go to those actually, because they're really great development for, for my kids. Um, and I go and race and have a blast. So you sort of have the tiers, the regional, national, and then international. And so you've been competing in this for a very long time or? Yeah, so I grew up in it actually. Uh, I, I've been paddling since I can remember. Uh, and I was going through my teenage years and I was pretty successful in the junior ranks and, and racing. And then something happened when I was like 18 or 19 and I just sort of lost the flame to be honest. Like uh, I was getting ready to go to a training camp, you know, in France or some super cool place. And I was like, oh darn. I don't want to go to France. I just want to stay home and do nothing. And I it sort of, I had it like this epiphany, like why, if I'm not enjoying the journey, if I don't, if I don't, you know, if the, it's, it's the journey, not the destination. And if I'm not enjoying the journey, then I'm wasting like my time and a lot of other people's time and a lot of money and, and everything. So I actually retired uh, and, and sort of grew the family business, uh, the rafting company, got married, had some kids. And then, uh, when we were watching the 2012 Olympics in London, uh, it wasn't me because my brothers raced as well growing up. Um, but one of my brother's wives were like, oh, look, you know, canoe slalom. Those are the same guys you raced with when you, you were kids and they're in the Olympics now. So like, maybe you guys should get back into it. Jokingly, of course, like maybe you guys should get back into it. You know, I'd go to Rio in 2016. And in our family, if you don't specifically say no to something, it's the same as saying yes. So we were like, well, that's a good idea. And then nobody said no. And so we were like, okay. So we came out of retirement. And it was cool because our kids were old enough to become a part of the journey. And so, you know, for me, so much of this is not just about me. It's about trying to give a vehicle for opportunity for my family, for my kids to travel. My kids are pretty keen on traveling. They enjoy it a lot. And there's no other way that I could do it. Um, so it's a really unique way to get to experience a lot of different things. When we go to like training camp, you know, I was just in Slovenia most of September and October, and we just lived in a house in this little village in Slovenia. And we hung out in Slovenia and did Slovenian things. And it's not like we go and we always do tour stuff. But when you're there for long periods of time, you get a better pace and a better feel. You know, we get the same thing. We spend a lot of time in Australia and you get to be more a part of the culture. And I think the kids get to see that. And for me, um, as a parent, it's something that's really important is I want my children to have a global perspective. I think a lot of the garbage that happens today is caused by a small perspective that doesn't see past your front door. And so, you know, in all of our travels, we always try to, you know, show the kids what the world is, not just what their high school is or what their middle school is, but like, this is what the world looks like. This is, you know, I've taken my kids to favelas in Brazil and to shanty houses in South Africa. And like, this is what kids your age live like and it's not a picture it's not a you know donate now to support little jimmy it's like there's little jimmy and this is you know we are blessed and we support them and we actually try to do like outreach and mission work whenever we travel uh and it's uh, i'm hoping it's effective and that they're going to be well-centered adults but we'll see they got a couple of years left so when you're traveling as a family, are they out there competing as well? Is there opportunities for them to, to complete, compete in different age groups or how does that work? Yeah. So presently, um, the sort of the way our season or our year works is when I go to like World Cups, when I'm racing, uh, I just take one kid. 
uh, and they come mostly because I like my kids and I really don't like to be by myself all the time. And so I like, it's, it's to like build a buddy. So I take a buddy along with me and we get, and it gives me a distraction from, because, you know, when you're doing two days with, you know, gym in between, it's like, all right, I'm going to work out for six hours a day, but I got to do something else. Otherwise I'm just going to sit on the couch and sleep. And then you get back to what's the point of what I'm doing. Uh, so for me, taking a kid forces me to go out and do experience and to have fun. Um, and so when I go to world cups, and world championships, I take a kid. Uh, but then when we do training camps, uh, we take the whole family. So like typically for us, training camps will be in Australia. Uh, hopefully this year it'll be uh, some time in France. Uh, we spend a bunch of time in Slovenia. Sometimes it's as, uh, as remote and exotic as Charlotte, North Carolina. It just depends oh, sure. on, yeah, the p depends on the year. And then we, uh, every year we do one trip without kayaks. Uh, because everything right now is based on on my schedule and on my timing and so uh, we do one trip uh, and typically we let a kid choose so each family member gets to choose where we go next so like my my daughter wanted to go to South Africa to see elephants and so luckily enough one of my other jobs avails me to a lot of uh, miles for for traveling so we're able to afford to, to travel pretty well um, and so we get to we get to do a trip every year. So there's plenty of opportunity for the kids to paddle, uh, especially when we're in training camp. In training camp, they paddle almost as much as I do. Oh wow, that's a ton. So like, yeah. you know, I would consider this let's call it a non-traditional lifestyle, if that's fair. <laughs> yeah, a bit. Um, so like, what's a, what's the trick of of holding it together? Like, what what uh, how, how are you not down each other's throats all the time and and uh, stressed out about it? Or you know, maybe maybe shatter some of those uh, outward looking in perceptions. Well, yeah, I mean, I to be totally honest with you, an elite athlete is the most selfish person you'll meet in the world. Like it's a part of the game. Like, like right now, everything is around me. Like our how we eat is how I eat, and how we travel is what I need to travel and. I try really hard to balance that for the rest of the family and make it opportunities, not something that they have to drag in. That's like where letting the kids choose where we go for our little family vacation became really important just because, you know, those are memories we cherish. The other thing is we're very adaptive. I fully understand that this is not going to last forever. And, you know, I'm burning it hot because I can. To me, the opportunity is here. And I have a choice to either take the opportunity or let it pass by. And at some point in time, you know, letting the opportunity pass by will be more important than taking the opportunity. But for right now, I have this opportunity to train, to race, to do something that I love. And my family is into it. They enjoy the travel. You know, at some point in time, they're going to, my son's going to be 18 and he's not going to be around. And so for us, like we're so focused on the now and saying, this is working for us right now. It may not work next year, but it's working right now. And let's do this as much as we can. Because we, my wife and I realized, you know, we've got limited time with our kids. And I don't want them to be out of the house and not have, you know, heaps of memories of cool stuff that we did as a family growing up. And that uh, we're able to sort of collate and mesh with being able to paddle and train. Uh, on top of that, you know, my kids pr are pretty into paddling. And so, it's a, and it's pretty organic. Like they have, they, we paddle, they paddle because that's what we do in our family. But like my son plays soccer, my daughter writes, it's not the only thing that we do. Um, but you know, it's a good way to get out of the house. And so for the kids, this is a great sort of segue into them starting to be competitive athletes if they want to, um, because we're sort of already doing it. It's like on this camp, I got to arrange that my son gets water time, not with me, but after me and coaching. So he's getting coaching and time and he's getting to put in his, you know, put in his work, put in his time to get to where he wants to be because he's super fired up to make the junior team and, you know, try to try to be, you know, travel and, and, and get to race himself. That's super cool to hear. So like, so your son is, is, uh, or I mean, all your kids probably, I mean, they're, they're, they're yeah. starting to kind of come into their own in the sport as well. So my oldest, this is the first year that he's eligible. So you have to be, you're not eligible to be on the junior team till you're like 14. And okay. so this is the first year he's 14. So this is the first year he's junior eligible. And so, yeah, I mean, he could, 
he could make the junior team and then gets to go to junior worlds and gets to get a cool jacket, you know, the team jacket. That's what you care about when you're a kid. Right. I remember the first time I made the junior team, I like, you got a sticker and a shirt and a towel. And I, I wore that shirt like every day for two months because I'm like, yeah, junior team right here. Yeah. U S canoe and kayak. Of, of course you would, man. You know, yeah, what? Well, I you know, one of the, if I could pull this back a little bit too, because I want to get into kind of the mindset or the, like the competitive nature uh, that you have. You you talked earlier about retiring, quote unquote, when you're like 18 or yeah. something like that. Uh, and then it sounds like you, you know, what were you doing in that time in between? Obviously building, helping uh, build up this family business, but then you got into jujitsu and then you fought <laughs> some MMA fights and like, <laughs> yeah. you know, take, take, what, what was the, the smorgasbord of stuff that you were into at that time? Well, so I got really fat first. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then I'd always wanted to do jujitsu. Like for, for me, ever, the way that my brain works, I love to be bad at something. I love a challenge. I like to just gnaw on things in my brain. Um, and I'd always wanted to try jujitsu. And uh, when Keith School opened in Meridian, I think I was like the second student in the door. I don't know, I would have been the first, but I was in Mexico at the time, so I couldn't be the first. Um, but I'd always wanted to get into jujitsu, and it was something I wanted to do. And as soon as I did it, man, it was like hook, line, and sinker. And not only did it give me something to do, and I enjoyed the mental process, but then once I got turned on to tournaments, it was like, forget about it. And so the whole time that I wasn't uh, competing in kayak slalom, you know, I had sort of, I was still kayak all the time, don't get me wrong, like, I have lived in a kayak ever since I was a kid. I wasn't out of boats. I wasn't training or paddling slalom, but I was paddling whitewater and having fun. Uh, and I was just hook, line, and sinker into jits, you know, and then I got to start doing tournaments. And then I really, really, really wanted to fight. And then I asked my wife if I could fight. And she said, oh, yeah, sure. As soon as we're done having kids, like a joke. But I remember earlier, I said, if you don't specifically say no to something, my family's the same as saying yes. As soon as we had our third kid, I was like, so. How about, how about a fight? She was like, what are you talking about? I said, you said after we're done having kids, I could have a fight. And she's like, oh my gosh, you're an idiot. So, yep. And then, and then MMA jumped in there. So for me, you know, I, uh, I have a profound love for the grind. I love, I, to me, like, I think about it this way. I have the luxury of being a professional athlete. I have the luxury of time to get to work out for six hours a day. It's not a burden. It's not like, oh, you know, I got to go do gym or, oh, I got to go stretch or I got to do yoga. Or I got to do accessory work. I got to go run. To me, when I have the time to train, I'm like a glutton just because it's an opportunity that you don't get otherwise. How else can you, how else can you get this opportunity to be able to like forge yourself as the best version of yourself in a very specific way? Uh, I, I, I don't, for me and my lifestyle and where I've gotten to, I don't have any other way that I can do that. You know, I don't really have a business per se, so right. I can't excel in business, but I'm sure you could do it in other stuff too. Uh, but for me, I'm always just seeking opportunity. And then once I have it, like just being honest with me and making sure that I'm utilizing that to the, to the extent that is possible. Yeah. And I, you know, it's, it's funny. That's actually how I got to meet you was, uh, you know, training under professor Keith Owen, uh, here in Meridian. Yeah. Um, I, won't forget, and I'll just kind of bring it up right now that uh, one, you know, I, I saw you, uh, you know, grappling and obviously you're, you know, I've got the black belt and you're just a savage. And I'm like, that's kind of the guy that I'd like to be in jujitsu eventually is just, you know, just somebody who, who really understands the art and is having fun with it and is willing to teach and, and all of those things. Uh, I, I remember the realization when we rolled together, though, for the first time that uh, the way that my son, who was at the time like five or six, would wrestle with me is the way that I felt. Uh, <laughs> yeah, with you, just you, just we've all been there, man. We've uh, all been there. Oh, I know it, but it's you know, it's just one of those realizations. Uh, but you know, let's let's tie these two worlds together. Like, what is it about jujitsu, and what is it about like the competitive like kayaking that are are similar that that allows you to the puzzle. Okay. It's a puzzle. It's a combination of, I mean, they're, they're very similar in the combination of mental and physical requirements. You know, in both sports, you have to be meant, you, you have to be mentally aware of you, all of your appendages and your surroundings. And if you're not aware of all of those, there's no 
there's no static, right? Like if I'm doing, uh, you know, a lot of sports, it's like, okay, it goes from here to there. And that's what it is. You know, it's pretty linear, but with jujitsu, it's always evolving and adapting with kayaking. It's always changing. It's always moving. And so you sort of get to go with that flow and sort of find your pace and your rhythm within, you know, either the grappling match or the fight or in a slalom course. And, you get connected to that rhythm. And once you can find that space, man, it's like, it's like nothing else, you know, where you're just sort of, it's not even hard. You're like, huh? Oh, this is fun. Like I should bounce my checkbook later. Oh, whoa, wait, no, we're still doing this. Oh, good. Then we're done. And I win, you know, it's like, those yeah. are the best, like that's the sort of stuff that, you, you know, you can't get anywhere else. And then, so um, you've been back at it out of retirement uh, for, uh, for how long now? I think for four years, almost okay. five. Okay. So I imagine, yeah. I imagine you probably have some interesting stories from the road. I'd, I would be interested to, uh, to hear what was that transition like? You know, you're, you're going from this oh life of... It was like Bambi on ice the first time. Yeah. So while I was away, like the, the sport totally changed. So the boats got shorter and the courses changed. And so when I came back, like, oh, yeah, this would be fun. And it wasn't. I was terrible at it. But just because everything had changed, like the way that the boats sit in the water changed. Um, but that's what I love. I love that challenge. I love the fact that I can force failure and find success all in the same, you know, sort of in the same sphere. And so for me, it was just this daunting challenge because not only was it uh, the technical changes that I had to catch up to, but then the physical, right? Because slalom is very, very unique in that of 90 seconds of output so my races are 90 seconds long two race runs in a day so on a on a rate day which is overwhelmingly exhausting it's 180 seconds of work that's it and in that 180 seconds you have to be as powerful as possible and as technically assertive as you can and so training for it's really hard because it doesn't fall into aerobic it doesn't fall into a lactic and it doesn't fall into lactic right? It doesn't fall directly into any of the energy systems. It utilizes a lot of all of them. And so training for it is, was a big jump because in jujitsu, you know, I, I'd gotten a pretty good training regime for competitions and stuff to where I wouldn't gas out, felt pretty good about it. But in slalom, I mean, just the blade pressure alone, you're talking about hundreds of pounds of blade pressure on a paddle that you're holding onto with your forearm. And so it's just one muscle group that's holding on to, you know, I think it's like, uh, 280 pounds of pressure is like the minimum that you can generate uh, over the course of 90 seconds. Just doing that alone is a huge challenge, but then doing that while manipulating it and pulling harder and using your other muscle groups to move the boat through the water and to stay on line when the, you know, the difference in a world cup between first and 10th place is a 10th of a second. So if you imagine running a 90 second whitewater course, right? Think of a big whitewater rapid you've seen on YouTube and paddling down that with 10 other paddlers, all while doing a bunch of gates you have to paddle through. And the fact that we come in within a 10th of a second of each other is insane because it's so close. So the biggest little changes can make, you'll be in top 10 or you're out. Uh, so it's remarkable. I mean, I, there was two races where it was down to the thousandth of a second. Wow. which is just mind blowing. Cause that's like, when you go through like their electric beam or not electric, their laser beams. I mean, that's just the difference of sticking your nose out and crossing the beam versus not sticking your nose out and crossing a beam. That's a 1,000th of a second. So right. it's nuts. So do you paddle like this now? Yeah, no, you go like, yeah. and then, <laughs> don't tell anybody, but you sort of throw your paddle at the end. There's a rule against it. You cannot throw your paddle at the end. You have to keep your paddle in both hands because people are starting to like throw their paddle. But yes, your last stroke, you kind of, and you don't know, you can't see it. You think you know where it is, but uh, yeah, you, you want to save every second. What you don't want to do is like chowder your first sprint because you screwed up your last stroke trying to miss the beam. I've done that before. <laughs> so, I mean, you touched on what it was like to get back into the sport. What, what was it to get into the traveling? I mean, how, how long did it take to adjust to that? Uh, and then like, what, what's that like? I mean, was it like adventurous so, yeah. or yeah. The, the traveling came sort of, uh, sort of organically. Um, it, I was very lucky, um, that for whatever reason, booking airline tickets to me is like playing Tetris. 
and I really, it's fun to play Tetris. And so for me, booking airline tickets is really fun. I like to find the best price, find the best routing and stuff like that. And I found some companies that, that have traveling salesmen that they have to book them a lot of airline tickets. And they were wasting heaps of money by letting everybody book their own tickets. And so I went to them and I said, hey, I can save you 20 to 30% on your yearly, uh, on your yearly budget for travel if you let me book the tickets for you. And they said, okay, well, how much does it cost? I said, it costs you nothing. The only caveat is that I get the points from the credit card that we use to buy the tickets to use for travel. So then I can leverage every dollar that they spend on their people for my benefit. So we wind up getting like heaps and heaps and heaps of points and miles and all this stuff, which has opened up the opportunity for us as a family to get to travel. Uh, because we get a crap load of points. And then, you know, I go back to the little game of finding out how we go. And for us, it actually started with, uh, we went to Australia uh, for a training camp and then coming home, we went to Japan. And it was, it was a, like, I, let me start off by saying when I was a kid, I grew up going to Chile. Like we've gone to Chile my whole life uh, to teach kayaking. So I've gone down to Chile. I've been out of the country. Um, but this was the first time I'd ever gone like way out of the country like to me chile was comfortable i speak spanish australia they spoke english we went to tokyo and like the kids were pretty young i think they were four six and eight and we went to tokyo in february and we had left australia so we had our australian clothes in summer down to february in J japanese winter and it was like it was amazing we were the biggest tourist nerds like it was the best trip ever we were underdressed had no idea what we we're doing i i in my head, like you use credit cards for everything, right? Oh yeah, that'll be easy. Only in Japan, you don't use credit cards for everything. So then I'm like, oh, I think this debit card works. So I, every morning before everybody else got up, I would go like scrounging around all the convenience stores trying to find an ATM that would work so I could get some yen out. So we had money to like buy food for the day. And so it, it was a lot of learning. Like my favorite picture from the whole trip is uh you know we we eat pretty cheap when we travel or we uh and we were at like a noodle house and in jap in japan like they're not heated it's really cold and you don't get silverware you get chopsticks in a bowl and so i have a picture of my son who was four he had one chopstick and like a bowl of soup he's trying to eat this eat the soup with a single chopstick and he's just, and he's wearing like a sweatshirt and a rain jacket and like a hat and every piece of clothing that we took and it was like, wow, way to be prepared, parents. You guys are awesome. <laughs> I tell you and, what. That's... And that sort of, it, it hooked us, man. It was the funnest trip. Like, we were walking around all the time, stuck, stuck out like sore thumbs, and we absolutely loved it. Dude, so you're, you're also a really positive person. I mean, you take these, like, experiences, and I think I, it's all in the matter of the lens in which you choose to look at things, right? I mean, it yeah. seems like as, as, we're, as you're reflecting here, um, you know, I've heard people tell stories, uh, about traveling experiences and if things haven't always gone perfect, I mean, it was like, this was terrible or this was horrible or this sucked yeah. or whatever. Um, you know, how do you fill your cup? How do you stay positive all the time about this stuff? You know, I, I think I, 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 I believe I have the, oh, that's my parents. Uh, when I was a kid, it was very like, cut like black and white like you could choose how you accepted a lot of things and you could be negative and and it would suck or you could like try to find out the positive like I spent a, a for me it was like growing up in Chile you know like we were my my dad's concept of teaching us Spanish the first time the first moment that I got to Chile right I'm 10 10 year old kid and this was I don't know how a while ago because I'm not 10 anymore and so you know we get down it's a long flight and we get down to Chile. I'd never been to Chile. We, we get there at night and we drive more and we get to this village and it's just dirt and we're staying at this person's house and finally go to bed and I wake up the next day and I'm like, all right, dad, where are we going? And he goes, well, I'm leaving to teach on a trip, uh, but you're not going anywhere. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, you're staying here to learn Spanish. Okay. And then he left for three weeks. That was it. I didn't, I was 10. I was in Chile in a dirt floored house with people I'd never met before in my life, not speaking a word of Spanish. And he left for three weeks. There was no phones in the village. I mean, this was like a village in Chile. If you ever watch the movie Alive, this is where they walked out to. Like it's in the Andes mountains, like it's way up there. Even now they just barely got internet. Um, and, but like, there was no phone, there was no way to get in contact. Like I was out there 
And like the first couple of days I was pissed, but then I was like, what am I pissed for? Like, this is, this is fun. I'm a dumb kid in Chile and like, I'm getting to meet new people and do new things. And I think for me, like that just happened. It just, I, I was put in positions where I got to choose how I wanted to accept it. And habitually, I just chose to be stoked about it and, and find the joy in it. And I think that might, I, I am overwhelmingly optimistic. My wife tells me that all the time. She says, if you weren't so optimistic, I wouldn't have to be so pessimistic to even get out. So, <laughs> well, I, but I think know, for me, it's just a choice. You know, you gotta, you can choose to which side you want to do. You can choose like, and it's only going to affect you. If you're, if you, if you're feeling bad and sitting on your laurels because life didn't treat you fair, then that's how you're choosing to accept it. Um, but it, uh, to me, I always want to try to find, you know, the silver lining or find something that brings me joy or brings somebody else joy to, you know, make it, make it through and make it a positive experience. What's the, uh, what's the craziest thing that's happened to you while you've been traveling? Oh, oh my gosh. I don't even, there's, I, there's favoritist craziest things. Honestly, one of, let's see. Okay. Here's my, my uh, we're on a theme here. We're with Chile. So yeah. we were in, in Chile. And I think I was like 13 or 14 at the time. And my dad is not the best pre-planner. So we went to this river called the Bio, Bio which is like this huge famous river in Chile. But this is super rural. Like I met people in Chile that had never seen white people before. Okay. Like they were looking at it like, oh, whoa, gosh, you're white. Like, yeah, I guess I am. Uh, and so we get to this place and he doesn't have anywhere to camp. We didn't have like proper tents and it was raining really hard. And so we found like an abandoned, like sheep herders, uh, like a shelter for the sheep and there's sheep in it. And so that's where we set up camp. So I didn't have a tent. So my dad's like, yeah, go sleep with the sheep. So, okay, I'm like a 14 year old kid. I'll go sleep with the sheep. So I'm sleeping with sheep. It's actually super warm, a little smelly. We wake up the next day and my dad's like, all right, we don't have any food. Okay, so you guys need to go find food. I'm gonna go teach kayaking. You need to have food by the time we get back for our guests or we're not gonna eat. So, so literally it was me and one brother and one friend. And we are just like walking around the mountains of Chile trying to find farmers who we could then barter with no money and what we had to get food to bring back so that we could eat and feed the clients. So like we traded something for a chicken. The guy snapped the chicken's neck and handed it to us. And then we were walking down and we traded like some shoes for a bunch of potatoes and we grabbed those. And we found like a box of cornflakes that somebody had and we got the cornflakes and we brought it back we're like here dad and then he made some ridiculous delicious meal and it was like the, everybody still talks about it from that trip like how good the uh bananas phosphorus he made with cornflakes and a banana that we found that, uh that that one was pretty out there but we've had you know it's we've had our our fair shares of joys and experiences out there that is what a cool story what a, and, it, and just to have a whole bag full of those things man oh my gosh yeah like and it, I, unfortunately, I can't treat my kids the same way that my dad did just because it's not safe. But like when, when we were kids, like he would just drop us off. We'd be driving around and, in Chile and he'd drop us off. He's like, figure out how to get home. Well, where are we? I don't know. Figure out how to get home. And we were like young teenagers at the time. And, you know, he, that really ingrained with us like self-reliance and being able to sort of, you know, figure your way out of a box, um, it, which I still, I love to this day. But at the time, it was like, okay, we're in nowhere, and we're supposed to get home. But that was the only choice, was to try to get home. Otherwise, you wouldn't, you'd be sleeping <laughs> on the side of a road somewhere, which is less fun. Dude, that is so wild, man. So, I mean, let's, uh, let's look out into the future. So, what's this? I know you're taking it year by year right now as far as uh, competitive athletics, but, like, you're in a training camp right now. What's the season look like for the rest of the year? I know I see you in the summers. Uh, yeah. Uh, so you must have at least see me a little bit off. after this camp. I'm going to, I'll be, I'll be home for, for December. So, uh, Olympic qualifications are the 9th through the 11th of April. Uh, okay. so that, and the big thing like with this sport and I assume with any sport is a very much of it, it, you get to a certain level and it becomes a performance, not the technical stuff is there. Like, oh yeah, you know how to do it. The conditioning hopefully is there, your condition. And then it's who can perform better that day, who can do the combination, not technically better, but just who can be in the moment and perform better. And so a lot of that comes from momentum through camp. So, you know, you have a camp, you come out of, typically you come out of camp in like March 
then you feel awesome. Like I can crush the world. That's where you want to be. Uh, at the beginning of camp, like right now, you know, things are feeling good, but it's not, you know, I'm not getting done every day. Like, yeah, like just destroy that workout. And so that's sort of the point of the repetition. And so we'll go home for December for the holidays. And then uh, it's essentially trying to find water that we can get to with COVID. Uh, so right now it's looking like going to Chile for a month and then coming home and going to France for a month and then come home and go to where they have Okay. And then like, we, you know, you talk about it being about performance, like how much data it, it happens in the training? Like, are you trying to, I mean, obviously if there's really thin margins, uh, are you using, you know, some kind of tool to, to track your performance day over day or like your. Yeah. So everybody does that a little different, like country to country. Um, in the U S we're not terribly well funded. And so we're not as tech savvy, like uh, some of the more, some of the well-funded teams are like down to the nuts and bolts video because they have a support staff of 50 people for 10 athletes. We have a support staff of like three people for 10 athletes. Okay. And so for us, you, it's sort of on your own, what you do. And so uh, I get to work with a really good nutritionist, and a good strength conditioning coach. Um, and I luckily enough for me, like I'm a nerd. I love data. I, like I said, I love to chew on stuff. And so for me, it's like the laboratory, like I get to play around with different approaches to conditioning, to sleep, to nutrition, and then different, you know, uh, technology that can support that. You know, so I spend a lot of time, you know, working with like HRV with my heart rate variability and how that affects my training, my diet, uh, and then, you know, really trying to hone in on what I eat and how that affects performance, how that affects energy levels, um, and so for me, I, it's really easy to go down that rabbit hole of trying just to tweak every little part. And with so many trackables that you can do now relative, I mean, you have a phone, you've got like the world's best tracking device, uh, the amount of stuff that you can, the m amount of data you can crunch. So like all of my workouts, every heart, all my workouts get recorded on heart rates and how the heart is actually beating the actual size of the waves and everything. Uh, and then that gets crunched into an app that then tells me, you know, essentially how productive that workout was. Uh, we have like paddles that have sensors in them that tell you how much blade pressure you're putting on each individual stroke. So you actually see like, oh, your power goes up and then you can reshape the power profile of your stroke. Um, there's, so, and all that stuff is user accessible. So you don't have to be a, like all that stuff I have for me and it's not that expensive, uh, which has been one of the cool parts, especially the way my brain works. I love to screw around with it and, you know, find all the variables. Yeah. And then as far as being a professional athlete, I mean, is there, is there like national sponsorship as far as like company sponsoring? Or is that an individual sponsorship as well? You have to go find those yourself. Um, That's yeah. the one. Yeah. In canoe slalom, uh, it's not, it's not well-funded. Um, we do have, I mean, they're trying, I don't want to seem like I'm bagging on canoe slalom in the U S because they're doing their best. Um, we just haven't had a, a, an Olympic medal in a while. And when that happens, funding dries up. And so they're, they're working really hard right now to build back up the program. But in the mean term, it's just private sponsors. My wife is my best sponsor. <laughs> she <laughs> she's, sponsors me all the time. I do have some private sponsors who are, who are instrumental. I, I literally couldn't do it without them. Just it wouldn't, the things that I need to do wouldn't be possible without their support. And so, um, and we have to be really careful, you know, uh, the hard part is with the volume of travel and the volume of, you know, like boats are expensive. A lot of the gear is really expensive. And so we have to be super mindful of, you know, the traveling schedule and, you know, how we eat and how we travel and everything just to keep the budget together. Okay. Well, that's awesome, man. So you've got, uh, you've got a competition season that you're training for, hopefully, uh, you know, COVID pending, uh, all will be good here in, uh, in April for, um, uh, for worlds, right? Yeah. I don't think I can do another, uh, I don't think I can do another, another delay when they, I, I was worried it was going to happen, but when they delayed the Olympics, like, cause I was coming out of camp, I felt great. I'm like, this is awesome. Like, let's like, I was, you know, a lot of times you, you don't dread selections, but selections is the hardest race you'll ever do because it's the only race that matters. The Olympics matter, 
but you, if you don't do well in selections, you don't make it to the Olympics. And so selections are, I hate it. I mean, they're the most pressure. So guys that I know that I trained with, we don't talk to each other. You don't talk to anybody. You're, cause you're not really friendly with everybody. Cause right now, you know, everybody's sort of at risk. I don't bring family to selections. I don't, I don't call my wife the whole weekend. I, she, we have a thing where it's just, I'm here. This is what I'm doing because it's so overwhelming. It's so important and so condensed um, that, you know, selections are, they're overwhelmingly challenging. Uh, and so that's a big part is being ready to go. So I was like ready to go into selections for the Olympics and then it got delayed. And then we didn't even know it was going to happen, but everything for, you know, it's like four years is building towards this one, this one catalyst, right? Selections is the one catalyst that everything you do, every, every time you run, every time you don't eat dessert, every time, everything you do is towards this one catalyst. And then to have that catalyst just disappear with no real knowing when it was going to happen. Like it took me, it was really hard for, for like almost two or three weeks to where, you know, I, I, so much of my life is goal-based and it's like a date, like, all right, this date, I need to be ready. And to not have a date, it's like, what am I even, what, what do I train for? I don't, I don't know if there's going to be a world cup season. I don't know if there's going to be Olympics. I don't, and it was, it was a lot harder on me than I thought it would be. I didn't think it would affect me. And like, it was, it, it really slowed me down. Like I was really kind of put out by it. And I, obviously I don't want to sound selfish. Like, obviously I'm glad that they postponed the Olympics. I'm, I've had COVID run through my family with very, very hard results. So I, I know how bad it is. Um, so don't, don't mistake what I'm sure. saying to be yeah. like, Oh, we should have it anyways. Yeah, there's... But just from the athlete's perspective, it was, it was very challenging. I'm sure it's not nearly as challenging to those that are, you know, battling with it, but it, uh, it's just hard when you have everything based towards that one day and then have that day disappear. Yeah. You know, I, and I think, you know, my perspective as it continues to get shaped by, you know, the times that we're in right now is there's certainly two truths, right? I mean, like we know that, like there's a virus and there's a real thing that's happening and people are hurting and there's had some never negative uh, impacts to, to individuals' health, to their families. But also, I mean, we can't ignore the externalities around that. There's two truths. I mean, it's postponed things, oh, yeah. jobs, economies, those types yeah. of things. And as we should honor as they, those things. Yeah. 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 As soon as the pandemic got politicized, we were in trouble. Oh, for sure. And because, you know, it's like two of my family members have had serious, serious, serious uh, COVID related problems and so for us you know it's a it's a sensitive subject as we got cut down but it just cut down at, by, at our knees from covid uh one of the hardest summers i've had in my life it was this last summer because we had one my sister-in-law got, got actually got uh viral myocarditis and her heart stopped and she was in a coma and she I was dead wow. for a while and then my brother got it and he collapsed in the parking lot and was having strokes at 42. He's having bunches of little strokes from uh, a defect he has in his heart. And so those all happened with about a month of each other. And so for us, like it was no joke. And we, you know, we did everything to, we did, we tried our best to do precautions and keep it, keep ourselves safe. But to me, yeah, I'm very sensitive to, to the Rona as it were. Uh, for sure, man. Yeah, it's a big thing. So we've got, you've got competitions coming up here uh, in April. Like, where can we yep. track you? Where can we keep up with what Trin's doing? Or like maybe, you know, what uh, websites would, or social media would you point our attention to? Yeah, uh, look up Long Family Racing on Facebook. That's where we typically post the most. Um, and that sort of gets you the whole picture. It's not just me uh, as I've got, what, five nieces, nephews, and kids that are all race. And so it's pretty, it's pretty fun. I mean, it's a really cool a unique experience for them and for me and you know you can join along the ride and see a bunch of knuckleheads growing up as they uh get to get to paddle and and challenge themselves absolutely i'll include a link to uh to that facebook page in the, cool. in the podcast so if somebody's listening uh definitely go down to that link and uh and add long family racing let's keep up absolutely. with this super interesting fun aquatic family man That's oh like yes uh anything else any stone left unturned trend before we uh we wrap it up today no, I think we covered it uh, pretty well. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's the opportunity is the gift to me. That's the thing. I always, I always appreciate opportunity and do my best to, uh, 
do my best to to utilize every chance I can. My wife always my one of my wife's favorite sayings is uh, you can't complain about work when you ask to eat. <laughs> and so <laughs> like and I take that everywhere. It's like I can't complain about the work I'm doing when I ask to race. I can't complain, you know, it's like because there's there's hard days, there's long days. It's like, yeah, you can't, you can't complain. You can't complain about the work when you when you ask to eat. So I, I take that one to heart. That's a big that's a big cue for me. Like, all right. Yeah, you're right. Darn it, Lindsay, you're always right. <laughs> smart lady. Well, all right, my friend. Well, thank you so much for making some time to hop on the podcast with me today. Um, you are like a really interesting, inspiring uh, guy. I can't wait to uh, continue to follow you and in, in your progress uh, through the year. And then obviously uh, when you're back in Boise, man, looking forward to uh, maybe meet you on the jujitsu mats here next month. For sure. Sounds great. All right, my friend, you take care. Cheers.